couple things today, uh, and this is really just the first of several webinars that we're going to be hosting over the, the next year. Um, uh, thank you for, to everyone for all of the, the crazy enthusiasm and support that we've had so far for these webinar series. Um, again, if you like these, please let us know just so that we know to continue them. Um, this is again going to be the first of two for the basics of laparoscopy. And then we will have more throughout the year that are focused on thoracoscopy, um, both, both basic and advanced and advanced laparoscopy, and then hopefully a boards, um, boards prep for uh, ACVS um, residents. Um, but to start things off, so I'll be talking today just about the equipment first. We're going to be going through three different brief lectures between myself and Dr. Singh. Um, each of the lectures is going to be around 20 to 30 minutes with an opportunity for questions after each lecture as well as a, an ability to do Q&A after the whole thing just so you guys can ask questions um, about the things that we talked about today. Uh, again, like I said, my name is uh, Chris Thompson. I'm a, a surgeon, just finished my fellow training for surgical oncology and actually starting um, to work or practice down here in San Diego. And so very excited to get started. Um, I will mention before we get into the actual lecture that, uh, again, we have a wide variety of webinars coming up for VES. Um, I'd really encourage anyone that's interested in knowing more about laparoscopy to join in on any or all of these. Um, and again, we love feedback. Please let us know if there are things that you like, things that you don't like um, as we move forward. And then uh, if you're not a member of VES, I, I can't say enough how, how much of a benefit it has been, at least for me early on in my training to join VES and learn from some of these amazing people on some of the newer techniques. And so um, I'll be sending a message out after the webinar in general about how to join VES. And so if you have a member already, I would, I would highly uh, recommend becoming a member in the future. Um, so getting to it, so getting started with the, the first lecture. So just talking about equipment basics, we're only, again, spending 20 to 30 minutes on this. And so there's no way that I can thoroughly cover everything with the, the actual expectation for knowing laparoscopic or endoscopic equipment. And so this truly really is just basics going over um, a lot of the mechanics of the telescope and the, the equipment, um, but definitely not getting in depth. If you wanna get into that, um, all of these themselves could be our lectures. And so um, if you wanna get into that more, we definitely can, but just to briefly cover most of these, we'll go over the basics, the camera itself, um, some of the peripherals as well as the, the inputs to so the light, sport, light source and the insufflation. Um, so really get into the basics. Uh, minimally invasive surgery or endoscopy is really just using some kind of uh, telescope into a body cavity to be able to get a, um, a optimized view of things. So not only does it have minimally invasive approaches, meaning that your incisions can be much smaller, but it does give you that benefit of you have a better visualization of the structures that you're looking at. So you get magnification. You also get illumination. So um, again, a lot of the things that we'll be talking about, um, yes, they are minimally invasive, but we do get the added benefit of the visualization um, from the laparoscopy endoscopy in general. And so specifically today, we're talking about laparoscopy. So we're really just looking at um, putting a camera into the abdomen to look at things within there to perform uh, various procedures. The absolute basics for this is that you have some kind of a scope or a telescope, which is what this device is here. We'll go into the basics of that, as well as the camera, the light, and the monitor. If you have those equipment, those supplies, you can truly do a lot of these very basic, uh, minimally invasive or, lap or laparoscopic procedures. So getting a little bit to the mechanics of it, for the vast majority of laparoscopic procedures that you'll be doing, you'll be using a rigid endoscope. Um, and so, again, in general, the rigid endoscope consists of a titanium rod that ho uh, holds in a lens or in some of the newer, actually a video camera at the tip here, but more commonly some kind of prism and a lens at the end that then allows you to project the image from inside the body cavity down this rod um, that is then captured within this ocular window or the eyepiece. Um, the endoscope also comes with a light, light post and then getting more to the details of this. Um, generally for most of the procedures that we'll be doing or what um, most in vet med is using, 
is going to be a five or a 10 millimeter rigid endoscope. Uh, definitely much more common to use a five millimeter endoscope than the 10 nowadays, especially with how widespread they are. Generally for most laparoscopic, laparoscopic procedures, we're using a 30 millimeter long endoscope. So um, compared to arthroscopes, these are much longer. It gives you the ability to truly see within the abdominal cavity for all of these patients. Um, the, the other more technologically advanced um, human side of things, they are getting into different kind of endos endoscopes. So you can actually do mini laparoscopy or needloscopic procedures where these scopes are getting down to even two to three millimeters in width. Um, to the point where you don't even need to close the incision that you're inserting the camera in. Uh, but there are trade-offs, meaning that there's no one-size-fit-all camera or endoscope for, for all the procedures, meaning that um, as you get to the more thin, the smaller endoscopes, you do have the, the loss of some of your imaging capabilities as well as the illumination. And so, um, again, a lot of us classically are gonna be using a, a five by 30 scope, um, but there are options for smaller ones. Um, there are bigger options and, and we'll get into that briefly um, with some of the other options. Um, one of the big thing about endoscopes that it's important for beginners to really notice and um, get used to preferably both options or multiple options is that they do come with different angulations for the tip or the end of the endoscope. So um, <clears throat> historically or initially, there were all zero degree scopes, meaning that what was coming out to the end of the endoscope was what was projected straight back. So your view was truly parallel in line with that endoscope. Um, the benefits of that is that there's no angulation, meaning what you are pointing that scope at is what you're gonna be seeing at the end of the, the camera. And so, you're looking straight ahead. It's very easy to adopt to, meaning that there's not a lot of um, practice needed to be able to stick a scope in at zero degree and point at what you want to look at. Uh, the downside is that, especially if you're going to be doing single incision laparoscopic surgery, if you're going to be doing um, a surgery where you're reducing your ports or you're just using one port and all of your instruments are going through that port, you have a lot more clashing with a zero degree uh, rigid endoscope. Um, so for instance, if we look at this, this particular kind of cartoon setup, if you have your scope going in through your sills port and you're trying to look at the gallbladder, if you also have a scissors or some kind of dissector forceps that you're trying to get in there as well, um, they have to be directly parallel to be able to get to the, the same position. And so um, you can see on this picture, if your instruments are parallel, you're going to get a lot more clashing of your hands um, that you'll see with these zero degree scopes. Because of that, um, they also have a 30 degree scope, which I would say is, is probably more commonly used nowadays. Uh, meaning with a 30 degree scope, the actual viewing angle that the, the endoscope is um, taking in is at a third, 30 degrees from parallel from the actual scope. Meaning that what you see is not exactly what the scope is pointing at, but it's 30 degrees offset. Um, and so the 30 degree scope is beneficial because it gives you the ability to um, not only look around things, I meaning you get a wider uh, field of view as you can actually uh, move that 30 degrees around within the abdomen to take a look at other things within the abdomen. Uh, but it also lets you offset your, your scope more if you are using reduced port or single incision, meaning that you can have your equipment going directly to whatever you're trying to see, but then you can offset your camera so that it's actually a way so your hands are not clashing as much. And so I would say that, again, a lot of us are, are moving towards using a 30 degree scope more so than a zero de degree scope. They both, def both definitely have their, their um, need or benefit in vet med, but um, I would say the workhorse for most of us are gonna be this the 30 degree scope. There are also 45 degree scopes and um, getting into kind of the bonus options or the the much more <clears throat> technological options. There is even a variable view endoscope, meaning that there is a, a scope that you can have zero degrees where you're looking straight ahead. But this one actually, again, it has a camera or a tilting mechanism at the end of the scope. So you can actually tilt it all the way up to 90 degrees. Um, it's a 10 millimeter scope, so it's a bigger scope. It's the endocomelium from stores. But again, this does have the added benefit, but of if you stick this in particularly a, a large dog thorax where you want to 
have that ability to look around to a lot of different regions and to look around things, look around corners per se, um, you have the variable um, view which can be of help. Other kind of brief option, bonus options that I'm just gonna mention but not really get into is that within the endoscope you do have other capabilities and so near infrared imaging is vastly and largely growing in both vet med as well as in uh, human medicine for laparoscopy where you actually have the ability to give an injection of something such as endocyanin green that will cause fluorescence of, of particular anatomy so um, lymphatics angiograms and then even tumors can be illuminated uh, more so than the normal tissue around it, as well as a biliary tract. And so um, the scope can actually differentiate normal versus abnormal tissue based off of what is fluorescing. So it has that optical imaging capabilities. And lastly, there's also 3D endoscopy. Again, this is, this is something where there's a chip and a camera at the end. It has two actual um, lenses or cameras at the end of the scope so it can um, simultaneously capture two images to give you a 3D picture when you're wearing fancy goggles. Um, it is something that I don't have a lot of experience with. It takes um, a lot of training to get used to, but it is something that um, as you get into laparoscopy, you'll notice that you lose that um, 3D uh, visual capabilities. And so they're trying to integrate that back in with some of these more uh, newer technologies such as 3D endoscopy. Um, get into the camera. So this is really just the unit or the device that takes your analog picture, so the actual imaging from within the abdomen, and then converts that to a digital format. Um, so the most two most common that I suspect you'll see in vet med are the Carl Storrs, which is the one on the left here, as well as the Arthrex, which is the one on the right. Um, they're both very similar and function almost uh, identically in terms of their general and anatomic setup of the camera. But um, in general, you have the ocular coupler at the end. So this is what actually attaches to your endoscope. Um, often has these little grippy buttons that you can press that will allow you to put the scope into the ocular coupler. Um, the next is going to be your focusing ring. So just behind that coupler or kind of the mechanism to hold on to the endoscope, you have the focusing ring, which allows you to, similar to any camera, allows you to bring things into very fine differences within your focus. Some cameras, so for instance, Carl Storrs here on the left, does have the ability for zoom optics directly on the camera itself. And so um, it gives you that ability to not only for some cameras, not all of them, but some you can do optical zoom, some you can only do a digital zoom. Uh, so similar to if you think from your iPhone with an optical zoom, you're actually zooming in on the structure with the lens itself. With the digital zoom, you're essentially just enlarging that picture. Carl Storrs does have the ability to do this um, optical zoom to enlarge the image that you're looking at, which can be beneficial. Um, and then again, they both have these program function keys, which allows you to access the computer within the camera. So um, this gives you the ability to actually change the settings. So if you want to um, change your light settings, if you want to change the focus, if you do have one of the fancier um, stores ones with the ability for near infrared, this is where you actually can um, turn on and off the near infrared fluorescence. And so this is your, your computer. And then within the camera itself is that chip that allows you to change the analog picture into a digital format that goes to your monitor. Um, one big thing I will say is that uh, again, it's, it's very important to make sure that all of your technology, all of your um, systems are matching and communicating um, and are functioning at the same level. And what I mean by that is the, the cameras these days can actually do all the way up to 4K imaging, uh, meaning that you can actually get 4K uh, definition on your image for the monitor, but there's no reason to have a 4K camera if you don't actually have a 4K monitor associated with it. Similarly, there's no reason to have a uh, 1080p monitor if your camera is not even high depth. And so, again, it's very important that you actually set these up consciously or uh, cognitively, making sure that the, the camera and the monitor are actually um, going to not only communicate, but are, at, but are at the same level to produce the image that you want. Um, and then make sure that, again, that they connect well, meaning that the general setup for everything is gonna be your monitor, your imaging system, the camera, the scope, and then the lighting system. So specifically getting into the lighting, um, there were a lot of different options previously. Nowadays, it's generally narrowed down to these two, meaning an LED option versus a Xenon light. 
Um, Xenon is, uh, was definitely the workers for a very long time, uh, just because it was very bright and had the, the benefit of the color reproduction was very similar within the abdomen as it was on the screen. And so Xenon was very popular for a long time for the lighting systems. Again, nowadays, a lot of what we're doing is moving more towards LED lighting. Um, a wide variety of benefits from the LED options, but biggest thing is going to be your efficiency, meaning that it uses a lot less power, a lot less wattage to produce the same uh, lumens or the same quality of your light within the abdomen. Um, and then it's a lot more low maintenance and it has a greater lifetime, meaning that you get about 30 times the amount of livelihood than the xenon capabilities. You don't have to replace the bulb. Um, so it has a, it's a much greater investment up front, but it does have the greater lifetime capabilities. And again, it is more energy efficient. Uh, the only other tip or trick I will mention for the lighting specifically is that um, one thing we will mention is that there are uh, some frustrations on occasion from the light post, meaning that the lighting goes directly, the light coupler goes directly into your endoscope at a 90 degree angle. Um, you do have the ability to buy these um, adapters that can actually convert the 90 degrees to another 90. So instead of it sticking straight out like this, you can actually have that go 90 degrees and then back towards your camera. So again, just ergonomics and the ability to um, not have as much clashing of your instruments can be done if you have the ability for the adapter. Um, lastly, get into monitors for these systems. So uh, there are now systems that have all-in-one monitors, meaning that your imaging system and your monitor is all um, stuck within this one system. So Particularly if you're going to be doing anything that needs to be portable, this is beneficial. Um, so things, especially like if you are, um, if you want a flexible unit that can be used not only for flexible endoscopy, but can pop into an OR for one lung ventilation placement um, or for cystoscopy. If you have one of these smaller all-in-one units, it's more mobile and portable. Obviously, it's a more uh, higher cost than the other um, standalone systems, but that is an option. Uh, I'd say what we're most, uh, or I guess most of us are most common or most familiar with is going to be um, one of these large carts that has all of the, all of the needs for your laparoscopy. So it includes a monitor that's up here. Again, if you have a 1080p uh, camera, make sure that you have a 1080p uh, monitor so that things are communicating well. But not only does it have the, the monitor, but it also has all of your units. So it has your imaging system, it has your light source on it, has the ability to hold the insufflator. It also can hold a lot of your peripherals, meaning that if you are gonna be using a force triad, it has that ability to have your um, actual um, electrosurgical unit on it as well. And then again, if you're gonna be doing arthroscopy or if you're gonna be doing any kind of advanced laparoscopic procedures that benefit or require irrigation and suction, you can also have that um, on it as well. And then lastly, if you wanna get really fancy, you want the kind of dream OR that all of us are hoping for, you can get all of these boom supported, meaning that you can get all of your monitors um, hung from your ceiling on the booms. Benefit is obviously that, especially if you have multiples, you can get one for yourself, you can get one for your assistant surgeon so that you're both looking directly at a monitor at all times. Um, and then it's boom supported so everything is raised up off the ground, which is not only a benefit for you, but it's also a benefit for your anesthesia team. Getting to the insufflation, so most of these units have dedicated insufflation um, devices that are associated with them. Uh, the CO2 is much more, or I guess is the most common uh, insufflation gas that's used in veterinary medicine, at least as far as I know. Um, reason for that is it's very safe, it's very common, and it's cheap. Uh, there are other gases that are used in human medicine, so Nitrous oxide, nitrogen, helium, helium, and argon can be used for your insufflation to create the pneumoperitoneum. Um, and Dr. Singh will talk a little bit about um, actually getting into the abdomen and, and the pneumoperitoneum then. But uh, if you are going to be inducing pneumoperitoneum, um, there are these other uh, gases available. But again, most commonly, um, CO2 is going to be used. 
there are downsides of using CO2. And so um, it's important to know those things. And especially if you get into doing a lot of high volume laparoscopy, it's very important to recognize the effects of the CO2 insufflation into the abdomen causing your pneumoperitoneum. So specifically, there's a lot of cardiovascular effects. So um, especially for high capacitance vessels, you can get a lot of side effects. And what I mean by that is your, your veins, not necessarily your arteries, but your veins can be very affected by the pressure within the abdomen. So as you increase the pneumoperitoneum, things like your caudal vena cava can actually get compressed from your pneumoperitoneum, which is important because if you are doing a procedure and you have your insufflation up to 12 or 14, you may notice that you're actually getting cardiovascular effects of that. And so it's important that you actually recognize that. Um, it also decreases perfusion to specific organs as you increase the pressure. So again, your portal vein, your portal system is affected, um, and then your renal system is also particularly affected. So your renal perfusion is decreased when there's an increase in, in your pneumoperitoneum pressures. And so um, it's important to know those things. And then you do get systemic absorption from insufflation. So um, it, again, these are important things that we'll have to notice and, and keep track of. If you're doing a very long procedure, you're going to get more systemic uh, absorption of CO2. And so that can have effects on not only your anesthesia, but on the patient's blood gas and actual um, just general biochemical parameters. So very important things to keep in mind as you are, are proceeding or getting more advanced with laparoscopy. One of the benefits of a lot of modern insufflation devices is that the units actually control for flow rate and pressure, meaning that you can set it at a standard eight millimeters of mercury, and then that actual system itself will be able to get feedback from the, the unit to increase the flow rate if we're losing pressure from a leak. It'll increase, increase the flow rate if for some reason you wanna increase your, your pressure within the abdomen. If you have one of your assistants that's leaning on the abdomen during a procedure and it's causing an increase in the pressure, then the system actually will decrease your gas flow. So it has this feedback mechanism that can actually adjust for that. Um, and then lastly, gasless um, laparoscopy is an option. I'm not going to get it into it in too much depth be just because I don't think that it's uh, a very commonly used procedure, but you can have devices that instead of insufflating the abdomen with gas will actually just lift away the abdominal wall. Um, downside is that you don't get as much of a working field or as much of a, a good working space within the abdomen, um, but the benefit is it doesn't come with as many cardiovascular side effects. And so that is an option if you do have a patient that is potentially less stable cardiovascularly. And then lastly, just for tips and tricks, it's really important to utilize patient positioning when you're doing these procedures. So gravity can really be your friend or your enemy, depending on what you're doing and how you use it. So for instance, if you're going to be doing a procedure at the cranial aspect of the abdomen, such as a hernia repair, um, it's important that you have the head up so that um, gravity will actually take most of your abdominal organs and intestines away from you as you're working. Conversely, if you're working more towards the caudal end of the patient, if you're doing a cryptorchidectomy and things are very bunched up there, you can put the head down so that, um, again, gravity takes the intestines away from you. So you have more working space without having to increase your insufflation. Um, getting into instruments, there's no way I'm going to be able to cover everything that uh, you'll come across for laparoscopy. So just very briefly going to touch on a lot of these so you're at least exposed to what instruments are available. Um, forceps that come in a massive quantity, massive variety of different forceps. These come all from grasping and tissue forceps um, as well as um, Babcock forceps, just so you don't have the same kind of serosal damage. You can get dissection forceps, meaning that these can be used and be very beneficial anytime that you're doing um, more dissection without any cautery. So particularly if you're gonna be doing gallbladders and need to dissect out the cystic duct, cystic artery, these right angle forceps are gonna be very important for that. Similarly, if you're going to be doing um, subtle dissections around the uh, adrenal glands and you're it's right next to your renal vein, you're gonna need some very precise and very um, specific Maryland dissecting forceps uh, to be able to do those procedures. And then lastly, and this is kind of more important for our discussion later today, but biopsy forceps are incredibly valuable. It makes the um, ability to do liver and pancreatic biopsies incredibly easy. And so having these on hand are gonna be very important um, just so you can grab that tissue in a very easy and quick manner. 
Um, scissors, again, come in all shapes and sizes, similar to what you see in a general laparotomy OR pack. So you have curved, you have straight, you have angled, you have micro scissors that can be more fine dissection. Um, the only thing I want to point out is they, that there is standardly a hook scissors in most of the packs. This is that if you're going to be doing any intracorporeal suturing or just have any suture within the actual uh, patient itself, the hook scissors are nice because it actually hooks around the suture as you close it. A lot of these, unfortunately, you, you don't have the same um, digital ability to, to know what you're cutting or kind of have that feedback mechanism. And so um, oftentimes things will leave the sutures versus if you have the hook sutures, it actually grasps the tissue as it's cutting it. Uh, retractors, I'd say the, the blunt probe is every minimally invasive surgeon's uh, best friend. This is something that is used for every procedure, I would say, and anytime you're doing an abdominal explorer, this is the first thing that you're going to reach to just because uh, the blunt probe, just like what it says, it's very blunt and so it's very safe around most tissues. It allows you to lift up anything within the abdomen to look up and under your liver lobes. It allows you to lift up the spleen so you can look at the underside of the spleen, it allows you to run the bowel more effectively. Uh, so the lump probe is incredibly important and um, is again used for almost every procedure. Fan retractors are also very good, especially if you're gonna be getting into things like a gallbladder procedure where you want to hold up um, the, the liver lobe in a more fragile or um, kind of cautious way. Um, I will just mention that um, it's important to exert caution, especially if you're a novice surgeon or you have a novice assistant that is gonna be using or manipulating the fan retractor just because these are um, thin metal, uh, pieces here and that actually can go into the tissue so particularly if you're using around the liver lobes or the lungs these can actually go into that parenchyma um, so it's important that you're very careful and always monitoring to make sure that this is not actually going into the tissue and then lastly just for vet med specific um, the ovariectomy hook retractor this can be um, put through the body wall percutaneously so it can retract your um, ovary at the suspensory ligament this is designed just for uh, vet med, so it's kind of nice. Uh, needle drivers, so one of the biggest things I would emphasize for any student or any surgeon that is going to be getting more into laparoscopy is that you truly need the ability to do laparoscopic suturing. If you want to get anything advanced beyond uh, um, a laparoscopic liver biopsy, I can't emphasize enough that you need the ability and the capability uh, and the know-how to be able to do laparoscopic suturing, whether it's just tying the knot, whether it's the ability to ligate things, or it's to actually suture and close things. So for particularly, if we're gonna be doing things like total laparoscopic uh, gastropexies, the ability to do actual intracorporeal suturing is an incredibly important um, skill to learn. So it's important to build a practice box and actually put in the hours doing the training so that you can learn how to do laparoscopic suturing. Uh, but there are a variety of different needle holders that um, can be used. So I would say, again, most common are gonna be either the Zabo Bursis, which are these um, down at the lower end, or uh, just these um, straight needle drivers, or the curved needle drivers here. Um, below this is the endo stitch. This is another um, device that can be used for intracorporeal suturing. Um, I will say that I don't have a lot of experience with it. In my hands, this is a much more convoluted way to suture. I think um, it's a, a bigger challenge. It comes with more headaches. That's another device that you may not need if you can actually get used to or, or get to know how to do um, laparoscopic suturing just with regular suture. And it is expensive, meaning that this is uh, several hundred dollars, US dollars. So um, if you can avoid it, I think, uh, at least in my hands, I'm more efficient and better without the endo stitch auto suture device. Um, again, suction irrigation, this can be very helpful, especially if you're going to be doing things like uh, biliary surgery, if you're going to be doing cholecystectomies, if there's any biliary leakage, the suction irrigation devices are beneficial because you actually have the ability to lavage structures. So if there's any biliary leakage, you can lavage and then suction out that lavage through these um, trumpet valve devices. So one controls for your your uh, saline irrigation, one controls for your suction, so inflow and outflow. Um, again, if you're doing any kind of biliary surgery, you may have bile leakage. If there's any contamination 
um, from the GI tract, which most of us would convert, but if you're really getting advanced and you're doing uh, intracorial GI surgery, that can lavage and suction. And then again, if there's bleeding, so if there's uh, bleeding related to the liver or the kidney, um, the suction actually allows you to suck away any of the, the blood that um, is coagulating just within the abdomen. Uh, and then lastly, retrieval bags. So we'll talk about another option after this, but retrieval bags can be very helpful, especially as someone who focuses on surgical oncology. Um, there are numerous, numerous reports of um, body wall seeding if we're not using retrieval bags, meaning that if you're trying to take out a tumor, uh, whether it's adrenal, kidney, and liver, and you're not using a bag, you're always at risk of seeding against the actual body wall where the reports are. So very important to use some kind of retrieval bag if you're going to be doing this. Um, downside of these is that they are quite expensive. So again, several hundred dollars typically for something like this. Um, I think they're 150 to 300, depending on the type that you use and where you get it. Uh, but it does have the added bonus of it protects the body wall from whatever you're retrieving. So if there's any concern for uh, bacterial contamination or neoplastic contamination, these can be very helpful. Um, it also allows you to get bigger objects out of a smaller hole, meaning that if you're trying to get a uh, four or five centimeter adrenal tumor out, um, you can get that out of your um, two to three centimeter um, Sills port incision just because it actually squeezes the tissue and allows you to um, have a frictionless way to get that out. Um, a more economical or a cheaper version of this um, that if, if it's feasible or if it works for whatever you're doing, I would suggest considering is to use the thumb of a sterile um, surgical glove. Uh, so you can actually just cut the thumb off and then if you invert it, it becomes more rigid. So you can actually put it, put the thumb um, piece into the abdomen, put your tumor, or put your stone, whatever you're moving into the, the thumb and then pull it out through your um, incision, your port site. Uh, it can be very uh, useful. Uh, and again, it's hundreds of dollars cheaper. So especially if you have a small, if you're doing adrenalectomy in a cat, you have a small tumor, this is a very good option to consider. Um, and again, saves the client that several hundred dollars. Uh, I won't get into too much detail for the um, energy devices, just because again, this could be an hour long lecture on its own. Um, but similar to open surgery, um, electrosurgery has truly revolutionized our ability to do surgery. I'd say most surgeons would agree that um, electric collar electrosurgery has been one of the things that in the last 10, 15 years has really expanded our ability to do surgery and what we can do. And similar in laparoscopic surgery, um, electrosurgery can be incredibly beneficial because it gives you that ability to not only dissect, but it also gives you the ability to um, coagulate small vessels. So up to two millimeters can be coagulated with a lot of these modern and polar devices. Um, most of us are going to be using a standard monopolar uh, cautery pen that comes with whatever force triad or whatever unit you're using and then just attach one of these longer laparoscopic extensions onto it. You don't need a new device just to use a, a laparoscopic monopolar um, extension. You can use the same cautery pen that you used before. You can also actually attach your monopolar cable onto most of your laparoscopic instruments. So at the end of those instruments, there will be a little probe that you can attach a cable to that allows you to send a monopolar current through the device. Um, I would give major, major caution to anyone that is not experienced or if you have any potential doubt about the quality of your instruments to not do this, just because this is incredibly, incredibly prone to causing unintended electrical injuries just because for a variety of reasons. But uh, number one is when you're doing laparoscopy, all you see is this very end of your device. And if there's any scratches at all along the entire shaft of your device that is causing escape of your electrical current, this can cause very severe unintended electrical burns. And so again, particularly if you're down at the region of the gallbladder and this region is resting up against any kind of intestine, you can cause very severe burns um, that you're not even seeing or picking up. Uh, you'll just notice that your cautery is not actually, or your current is not getting passed to the end of your device. And so I would caution against, against this unless you have incredibly good equipment and you're very uh, comfortable and confident doing this. Um, you can also get severe coupling to your ports. And so again, it's not very standard for us to use um, this approach in vet med at least, but it is available. Um, 
the, I would say most of us again are going to be using the dedicated devices um, and then uh, kind of just go based off of what is commercially made available for a monopolar cautery. There is bipolar cautery that you can use. Again, I don't think it's very common in veterinary medicine, at least um, from my experience, it's not something that has really been necessary, uh, especially with vessel sealing devices, as we'll talk about in just a second. But it is an option if you want fine cautery uh, capabilities for something that you're doing, if it's a small adrenal or if it's a, a gallbladder, this is an option that you could consider. Uh, but I would say a huge workhorse for most of us in uh, minimally invasive surgery is going to be using a vessel sealing device. So uh, particularly ligature from Medtronic is, is very common and very uh, beneficial for most of the procedures that you're doing. Um, for the students that are not familiar with the ligature, it's a device that essentially has a combination of pressure and bipolar energy that's emitted to these tips that as you close the tips, it can uh, seal off vessels. It can seal vessels up to seven millimeters in size for most of these devices. Um, again, massive benefit in that you not only can dissect with these, but you can also um, very safely cauterize. Um, it does come with a blade on the middle, so as you cauterize vessels, you can cut within it. Uh, the newer devices come in both five and 10 millimeter sizes, depending on how big and what kind of configuration of the jaw that you want. Um, and again, they come in a wide variety. I feel like every month there's a new uh, vessel sealing device that's getting put on the market. Some of the newer devices actually come both with the bipolar capabilities, but will have modified tips at the very end that actually have monopolar capabilities. So um, you can do both bipolar and monopolar based off of a single like ligature device. Um, and then lastly, ultrasonic dissectors. Um, harmonic scalpel is probably what most people are familiar with in terms of ultrasonic dissector, dissectors. It's a great option and I know a lot of um, people that do high volume laparoscopy will use harmonic scalpels and will actually use a combination of both vessel sealing devices and ultrasonic dissectors depending on the tissue capacitance and exactly what you're trying to accomplish. Um, but very similar to a vessel sealing device that gives you the ability to seal off um, vessels as well as dissect. Um, they come with the ability to have both blades and a bladeless option. So the one we we're looking at before did have, didn't have a blade. Um, it still can cut through tissue even though there's no dedicated blade, but they do also come with a, a cutting blade. The benefit of harmonic scalpels or ultrasonic dissectors is that they do have a lot less heat production. So you have a lot less bystander injury uh, from the use of a, a harmonic scalpel energy device. Um, and there's no energy coupling, meaning that there's less of a risk of iatrogen, iatrogenic damage if there's any um, equipment malfunctioning. Um, the downside is that it's only up to five millimeter vessels, where again, the ligature is up to seven millimeters. I'll be honest that for most of us, if we're getting a vessel that's up to seven millimeters in size, we're not going to be using a, a ligature. We're going to switch to clips or something like that. So that two millimeters of size probably doesn't actually make that big of a difference. Speaking of clips or staples, um, again, there's a massive, massive variety of stapling devices that are available for laparoscopy. I'd say the most common that we're gonna come across or use are gonna be endo-GIAs. There are also endo-TA stapling devices. Benefit of the endo-GIA is that it actually lays down six rows of staples so that you have three on either side of whatever you're trying to ligate, and then it cuts down the middle. The TA does not have the, that capability. Um, but there are endo TA, TA options. Um, there's a variety of lengths, there's a variety of staple heights. Um, it's important that you have a, a multitude of these if you're gonna go forward with these procedures, just so if you come across something that is uh, bigger or longer than what you would expect, you have the ability to still um, coagulate or kind of staple ligate those with your device. Um, just general information, so most common I would say is gonna be the endo GIA 30. Um, that most of us are using. It's gonna be the white or the blue um, for a 2.0 or a 2.5. Um, the benefit is that these can do hemostasis for very large vessels. The, it's kind of sad, but they know this because they actually stapled these across a lot of pig, caudal vena cavas, and aortas. So they know that they can actually ligate up to 15 millimeter vessels in size. But for us, practically speaking, this is beneficial because it can be used for your renal artery as well as pulmonary arteries. And the benefit is that it seals up for, to a very high pressure. So 310 millimeters of mercury, which um, there's very rarely gonna be an occasion that you're gonna have systemic hyper hypertension that's ever gonna cause a rupture of that. 
Um, and then lastly, if you don't want a full row of staples, you do have the option to use clips. Um, again, there's tons of different manufacturers that make a wide variety of these. So a lot of your use or your experience is gonna be dependent on what you actually carry in your hospital. Um, but for clip reasons, there is the endo clips um, over here from Covidian, now Medtronic. There's the Legamax, which is from Epicon. And then there's also uh, a couple of different units from Teleflex that utilize the WEC um, clips or endo clips. Um, benefit of the WEX is that you can both get um, ones that load automatically and have multiple uses from one device, meaning that you can get uh, multiple clips from a single device. They also come in these single unit ones, which are used very commonly for gallbladders, the cystic duct and arteries. Um, again, and they also have the benefit of both being metal and polymer. So if you have a patient that for some reason you don't want the effects of the metal, you can always use one of the polymers. Um, so that's kind of the basics for uh, the equipment um, that I was going to cover. Again, not a lot of time, so we didn't cover everything in massive detail. Um, but with that, I will entertain any questions that anyone would have. Um, so one of the questions was, do you have a preference between stores versus Arthrex cameras? Yeah, I would just say, you know, it'd be worth if you're making that <clears throat> or considering making that big purchase, you know, it'd be definitely worth having both those reps bring the gear in to you and, you know, get your hands on it and just see, see yourself what you prefer. That'd be the, that'd be my suggestion. There's yeah. a couple other questions here, Chris. Uh, uh, so Phil has one. Does the Endo TA have a cutting device with it, or is it similar in application? Do you want to do that one, Chris? Yeah, so I actually have not used the Endo TA. Um, as far as I know, the, the Endo TA did not have the blade when I looked into it last, um, but it's been a while since I've actually looked to see in those capabilities, just because if we're going to be doing uh, laparoscopic procedures, again, most of us are going to jump to the Endo GIA just for the ability to. Um, seal off both sides, um, but I can look into that. I, I didn't even know they made an endo TA. Is that a thing? Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, I can. Oh, look thanks into the for TA. telling me, Phil. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the beauty of the the endo GIA is that uh, you know it's one shot and you've separated or divided whatever tissue you've. Uh, captured and it's super reliable instrument. Yeah, I guess I just don't see the the benefit of the TA over the GIA for what we're doing, um, unless it's economically much more uh, cheaper. All right, there's another question. So, what would the benefit uh, be to doing uh, laparoscopically versus an open spay, apart from being less invasive? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a bunch of uh, advantages, you know, number one, if this is, if these are procedures that you are, uh, you know, just starting to do in your practice. So that's probably the first thing that you're going to, or the first procedure that you're going to begin with. And that's how you will gain some experience with the equipment. Um, as far as advantages to um, the animals, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different um, research papers that have shown some benefits, whether it's faster return to recovery, um, reduced infections. Um, but, you know, for sure, that's the building block for your practice regarding these procedures. Uh, so yeah, Chris, I don't know any other comments. Yeah, I agree. And we, we are, not to plug it, but um, to plug, we are going to be covering lap space in the second part of the webinar series. And so um, we will go a little bit more in depth on the, the literature and kind of comparing that to a, an open procedure. So I'd agree that in general, the biggest thing is, is going to be pain control, but there's always that added benefit of the visualization benefits from laparoscopy compared to open. Another question, what exercises do you recommend for box training? Yeah, it's a great question. The, um, the VALS program, which is, uh, which sorry, which stands for the Veterinary Assessment of uh, Laparoscopic Skills, 
which has been developed by Bull Franson and is, is sort of uh, along the lines of the training program for human surgeons, which is the fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery. They have a, a set of exercises that, uh, you know, that are progressive and will gradually build up your skills. They have recommended times for those. So if you are interested, uh, you know, looking, they have a website for that, and I, I would definitely point you in that direction. Yeah, and I and did, then along uh, those lines, oh, sorry, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanna say I did put um, on the chat um, just the, a link to the VALS program. So you can see, <clears throat> again, they have great, uh, not only like explanation of what, uh, recommendations for procedures, but also performance goals, meaning um, what it would be good to get things down to. And then similarly along those lines, are there commercial training boxes available through the manufacturers? Um, yeah, for sure. So if you check out that same link, there is a, um, a box available, a training box available through VALS. I will also tell you, I mean, I actually have two of those VALS training boxes in, um, you know, just in a small lab uh, for, you know, for my residents to train on. We've done a bunch of different research projects with them but uh you know if you go online there are a ton of different uh, methods for making uh you know training boxes at home just using a camera from your laptop uh and and so that could be a definitely a, a more economical way to you know practice some of these skills because they are very unique skills uh you know as far as depth depth perception um you know two-dimensional image on the screen and so you know anytime you can get some practice in if it's not in a you know a, a client-owned animal uh, then that's going to be to your benefit for developing these skills for sure yeah. one more question so which energy device would you suggest uh, and I think it's the same thing with the um, endoscopy equipment. You know, there's so many, I think Chris mentioned, there's so many different vessel sealers out there. I agree with him wholeheartedly. I do think that it is an essential uh, piece of equipment when performing even basic uh, procedures. So for example, ovarectomy. Um, but you know, whatever one you have, uh, or if you have some reps that can bring in uh, some different types, then, uh, you know, I would try them all out. I personally, I, I'm lucky enough, I have a uh, force triad. I also have the um, Ethicon products as well. Great.